To quote Dolly Parton, love is something sent from heaven to worry the hell out of you. I'm your host, Leah. Love. True love. (laughs) I'm Phil. And I'm Steve. Today's episode is full of love stories that will either warm your heart or turn your stomach or both. If you have an appetite for the strange and bizarre, then pull up a chair and grab a spoon for another intriguing serving of Remnant Stew. Remnant Stew is gluten-free, organic, made from all natural free-range ingredients and guaranteed to provide the recommended daily serving of curiosity. Now, before we dive into those wonderful love stories, let's take a look at the calendar. And, uh, of course, today is February the 14th, Valentine's Day. Woo-hoo! Valentine's Day is a celebration of love and friendship. The idea of Valentine's Day seems to have originated during the Middle Ages, somewhere around the 14th or 15th century. The holiday derived its name, though, from two Roman martyrs for love, and both of them were named Valentine, by the way. The first Valentine was beheaded on February 14th, but not before <laughs> leaving a note signed, from your Valentine to his lady. That was kind of a nice note. <laughs> the second Valentine was supposedly a bishop who secretly married young people as an act that was forbidden by the Roman emperor who wanted young men to first serve as soldiers before marrying. Valentine ignored the law and he was beheaded as well. So both of the Valentines for whom Valentine Day, Valentine's Day is named were beheaded for their acts of love. Thankfully, we don't we don't reenact that. So. Yeah, that <laughs> we haven't found that. Oddly possible. enough, we haven't reenacted that part of it. <laughs> Thinking about our cele- our weird celebrations of our last episode. So okay, <clears throat> so do other countries celebrate it like we do? I um, wonder. I believe it has become somewhat international. Okay, it okay, because it's our commercialism. Exactly, oh, as, as why, behind, yeah. what's behind picks Valentine's up on it Day. for sure. Well, now, this Thursday, February 17th, is this is a good day. We love here at Remnant Stew. Random Acts of Kindness Day. Yes, Absolutely. that's a good day. Right? Yeah, yeah. Random Acts of Kindness Day seeks to encourage kindness within society. This day aims to inspire people to be generous and kind by performing gracious acts. Some ideas include donating to charity, recycling, or simply being considerate to friends and neighbors. Random Acts of Kindness Day was established in 2004 in New Zealand. So happy Random Acts of Kindness Day this coming Thursday. And and normally we wouldn't want you to toot your own horn, but on this day, um, and I'll post something on, on our social media. Toot let us away. know. Yeah. Do what? Toot away. Toot away. Yes. Toot <laughs> Tell away. Tell us what you did. Let us know what you did or what was done for you. Or what was done for you. That was even better. Right. Then next Monday, of course, <clears throat> February 21st, is President's Day. Now, last year, we did a really terrific episode for President's Day called Positively Presidential. That was a good episode. Some really great stories. In fact, one of our favorite stories that we ever did uh, involving um, William McKinley uh, is in that episode. So go back and give that one a listen on Monday, President's Day. And it, it's uh, amazingly non-political. Let's exactly. Just say that. Absolutely. That's right. Exactly. And finally, Sunday, February 27th, is Dominican Republic Independence Day. That's right. Dominican Republic Independence Day commemorates its independence from Haiti on February 27th, 1844. During Haitian occupation, the secret society, La Trinitaria, led by founding father Juan Pablo Duarte, enacted a coup against its Haitian rulers. The society's success led to the establishment of the Dominican Republic's independence. So, happy Independence Day to all of our listeners over in the Dominican Republic. All right. Uh, Interesting about those two countries on that island, Haiti and the Dominican Republic. One, the Dominican Republic has actually been fairly prosperous. Haiti, uh, Haiti, not so much. So, um, and I don't know. I really don't know how they survive because here in Texas we get. The hurricanes and everything, right. but every hurricane that comes into the Gulf, whether it hits Texas or, well, or Louisiana, you know, Louisiana, wherever, Louisiana right. wherever, just wipes that island clean. Right. Hispaniola seems to get hit really, really hard for sure. Yeah. So happy Independence Day to the folks over in the Dominican Republic. All right, let's just take a quick little break here and let us just speak to you from our heart for a second. As you know, we are currently in our third season here at Remnant Stew. 
And we have brought you so many crazy and fun stories in our 40 or so episodes. We have been downloaded over 7,000 times across 42 different countries. Wow. And we are so thankful to every single one of our listeners. Yes. We really love what we do, and we are committed to continue bringing you more stories of the strange and bizarre for many more seasons. But while it is free for you to subscribe and listen, it isn't free for us to produce. That's right. So we are asking a favor from all of our listeners. No, we're not asking for money. But, but if you are so inclined, <laughs> we're not going to stop you. Don't pay attention to Phil. <laughs> no, we are asking instead that you take just a couple minutes of your time to show us some love by writing a short note saying what you love about Remnant Stew. Yeah. We are currently in a contest for emerging podcasts to be awarded sponsorships. And the notes that you send will help our standing in the contest. Absolutely. It takes just a couple of minutes. Please go to our website, www.remnantstew.com, and click on Show the Love and follow the, the instructions love. from there. It really is very easy, quick to do, and it would mean so much to us. Absolutely. So thank you in thank advance. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Mm-hmm. And now, back to our regularly scheduled episode. Dun, dun, dun. Now let's get on to our story, shall we? Um, my sister was one of my favorite people, my sister Diane. Um, and uh, she was recently telling me about a couple that she knows. Um, Diane graduated from high school in 1964, so she's just a little bit older than me. And uh, she's made uh, an actually pretty close friendship with many of her classmates. They hold regular reunions, and they even still participate in the school's homecoming parade. Uh, their class actually has a float in the homecoming parade from 1964. Wow. She told me about a couple in their group named Marilyn and Mondo who have recently gotten married. Now, back during high school, they were always very close friends and were often seen sitting together. However, there was an issue. You see, Marilyn was Caucasian and Mondo was Hispanic. And in 1964, that type of relationship, well, was frowned upon to say the least. But after graduation, they both married other people, raised children, and had careers. However, within the past uh, few years, both of their spouses have died, and now in their 70s, they have reconnected, and they are now married. Well, good for them. Isn't that nice? Yes. Everyone loves a good how we met story. Um, Either one of you want to share how you met your spouse? (laughs) Mine didn't like me. (laughs) Has it gotten better? (laughs) <laughs> I'm not oh, really trying there. to pause. Oh no, no, it's got, <laughs> it was funny. So she, she, uh, she, she wasn't. Uh, she, I wasn't her. I wasn't on her friends list for a while <laughs> in our church, uh, uh, you, uh, our uh, church singles group. So it, it took it took a few months to figure out that I'm okay. Well, that was good. <laughs> it it took a around. few months of your charm, just yeah. Right. <laughs> That's, great. That's what it is. <laughs> well, we okay. So, so my story is a really wholesome one. The night I was baptized is when I met my husband Paul because he took care of the baptistry. I knew who he was because he's the song right. leader of our church. But if you ask him how we met, he will look at you, bald faced, lie to you, and tell you <laughs> that he met me when I was belly dancing at the <laughs> Renaissance Festival. Yeah, I've heard that one too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I went, whatever. It makes a better story. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, Phil, my first wife uh, passed away many years ago, but uh, when we first met, she didn't like me either. Um, you know, <laughs> like one night I was, uh, we met in college, I was sitting across from her at the dining hall, and I was chasing green peas around my plate in what I thought was a comical manner, and she didn't <laughs> find it attractive at all. So. <laughs> Somehow, hey, around from the right, here oh, he comes, that's... going for the final stretch. Somehow, we uh, we we overcame that and had uh, <laughs> many years of good marriage. My second wife, uh, we met at church, so that yep. was fun. Yeah. Um, I love having to meet uh, in a time mm-hmm. that they the pastor actually had a chance for people to stand up and uh, greet each other for a little bit, and that's where we met. Awesome. Mine was like I said, Becky and I met in a <laughs> church singles group and. <laughs> Well, anyway, since today is Valentine's Day, we're going to share with you the stories of some couples who had unusual meetings. Uh, the first few stories come to us from ODDEE.com. Is that OD or OD? I'm not sure. Not ODDEE.com. Sure, either way goes. Now, it's nice to hear that at least one good thing came out of the horrific tragedy of the Boston Marathon bombing. Right. 
Uh, many lives were tragically changed on April the 15th, 2013, when two bombs exploded during the Boston Marathon, killing three people and injuring hundreds of others. I remember that. Mm. Among the estimated 264 injured was uh, James Costello. After undergoing multiple surgeries at Massachusetts General Hospital, the marathon participant, uh, participant was transferred to the Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, and it was there that Costello's life would be forever changed. He met and befriended Krista D'Agostino, a nurse who cared for him during his rehabilitation. Soon their friendship blossomed into a romance, and the couple were engaged in December 2013 and were married August 23rd, 2014. So it was a nice, uh, good thing that came out of a tragic yeah. event. Yeah, congratulations, you two. Now, I don't know if you have ever heard of a fellow named Bill Wyman, but I'll bet you've heard his work. Uh, you see, Bill was a founding member and uh, bass player for the Rolling Stones uh, for more than 30 years. Well, you see, in 1989, Wyman, age 53, married Mandy Smith, age 19. Oh. Uh, well, Oop. as you might guess, that marriage didn't really last uh, very long, only about two years. However, something unusual did occur. Before they divorced, Wyman's son, Stephen, became engaged to Smith's mother. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> he married his father's mother-in-law. Oh, wow. Think about that. Your father's oh. mother-in-law. Okay. Now, sometimes a person's name fits the person perfectly. For a funeral director turned matchmaker, you couldn't ask for a more appropriate name than Lynn Love of Cooperative Funeral Care in Wickford, England. <laughs> <laughs> After helping arrange two separate funerals, one for 76-year-old Tom Lennon, who lost his wife, mm. and another for 70-year-old Isabel Bacon, who lost her husband, Love kept in contact with each of the grieving pensioners. The funeral director took matters into her own hands after the widow and widower both complained to Love about being lonely. She arranged for Lennon to take, uh, to take Bacon out on a blind date. Six months later, the pair married with Love as the witness. Tom later recalled, loneliness is a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. If it hadn't been for Lynn, I would never have met Isabel or realized that people like her existed. Said love of her matchmaking success, quote, I think if I died tomorrow, this would be my greatest achievement. Aww. Oh, wow. Nice, nice That's story, cool. huh? Okay, so the, it's funny because uh, something me and my kids like to do is try to, to make up business names that, that don't necessarily go together, kind of like live bait and nail salon, you know, right. or whatever. This oh. is like funeral and matchmaking. There you <laughs> they, go. <laughs> they put that out there. Uh, down the road, there, there was used to be a boat rental and psychic. Remember that? See, yeah, see, that's what I'm talking about. Not, not too far from the cut and shoot area here. I foresee. Uh, psychic and boat rental. That's sell your was, boat. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, in uh, 2013, Bob Humphreys, age 89, and Bernie Blewett. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, I bet he B did. B-L-U-E-T-T, -T, 87, got married in Somerset, England. The two had actually met, though, eight decades earlier. <laughs> and they were even childhood sweethearts, but they lost touch during World War II. Mm. During the war, Bob joined the Army, and Bernie enlisted in the Royal Air Force. Although the soldier penned love letters to his sweetheart, they were never passed on to her by her protective parents. After not hearing from Bob for nearly two years, Bernie married a RAF pilot and immigrated to New Zealand. For decades, they each lived their lives on opposite sides of the world with their respective spouses. Bernie's husband, Roy, passed away in 2002. Bob's wife, Beryl, died a few years later. Contact was reestablished in 2011 when Mrs. Blewett's daughter discovered that Mr. Humphreys was still alive. Bernie moved back to Somerset, and the couple uh, were wed two years later. The new bride says, quote, when I saw him again, I didn't see an old man. I saw that young soldier. We Aww. both feel young at heart. Oh, that is so sweet. Nice. You know, my my uh, in laws were married for uh, I want to say over sixty years before my grand or uh, my father in law passed away, and he was always they. It was just always so sweet, you know, the way that they right. and he would call her my love. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, uh, Mary and Stephen Lindoff. They've been married for over 40 years, and they are an extremely close couple who can read each other perfectly. 
And they've had to rely on touch and intuition in their relationship as both husband and wife experience varying degrees of deaf blindness. Oh, wow. Stephen is completely deaf and has minimal vision, having to get nose pressing close to a TV to watch it. Mary was born deaf and started losing her vision around age 13, sorry, about 13 years ago. Hmm. Uh, The two met when Mary was nine and Stephen was eight. Stephen sat behind Mary at a school for the deaf in Montreal, Canada. They parted ways soon afterward when Stephen moved to Ontario and Mary left for Newfoundland. The couple didn't reconnect until two decades later when, in the 1970s, Stephen moved to Newfoundland and ran into Mary while shopping. They were married in 1979. Losing some of their senses has heightened their sense of touch. Stephen playfully told the Toronto Star, The sex is good. (laughs) <laughs> hey, keep this family friendly. <laughs> okay, okay. So now for some sweetly romantic stories. Um, in the UK, near Wickwar, I think that's how you say it, Wickwar, uh-huh. near uh, south of, um, okay, so how do you say that? I think it's Gloucester. No, I think it's Gloucester. Gloucester. Okay, or at least Gloucester. That's how, that's, at least that's how they say it in New England. Okay. I'm not sure about over, yeah. uh, overseas. G L O U C E S T E R. Uh, is a plot of land planted with over 6,000 oak trees as a sweet memorial to love. Winston Howes planted the trees on a six-acre plot shortly after the love of his life passed away over two decades ago. Mm. Winston and Janet Howes were married in 1962. They lived happily on Winston's farm where they raised their family. But in 1995, Janet Howes passed away suddenly from heart failure, leaving Winston a heartbroken widower. Mm. Winston then planted the oak grove in Janet's memory, but there's a secret to the grove that wasn't discovered by anyone outside the family until 2012, when a balloonist flew over the site. Nestled in the middle of the towering oak trees is a heart-shaped meadow, bordered by a bushy hedge. It's impossible to see the meadow from the road, and all these years later is now fully formed. So, I mean, think of how long. Yeah, Yeah, think of how long it takes for the for oak trees to grow. he says, I thought it was a great idea. It was a flash on inspiration, he told the New York Daily News. Once it was completed, we put a seat in the field overlooking the hill near where she used to live. House said, sometimes I go down there just to sit and think about things. It's a lovely and lasting tribute to her, which will be here for years. Yeah, 6,000 so, oak trees. Wow. That's a lot, and, yeah. Okay, so I it took me forever to find it on Google Maps. But if you want to see it for yourself, search for Wickwar. UK, and then start looking on the satellite image just northwest of Wickwar. And I got oh, nice. my info from NewYorkDailyNews.com. But yeah, it's on. It's there on Google Google Maps, and you can see it. Oh, that's awesome. awesome. Cool. Nice. Okay, so did you know uh, that many brides of the 1940s wore wedding gowns made from World War II parachutes? You know, I had heard this, yeah. Yeah, so a soldier's parachute was a powerful symbol in those times. The life-saving device allowed many soldiers to return home to their sweethearts, and the trend to make bridal gowns from parachute silk or nylon got started well before the war ended. The parachutes of World War II were first made from silk and then later from the cheaper and more accessible nylon. Mm-hmm. And in the spirit of industriousness, you remember that all, right. women all across the Allied nations gave up their nylon hose for the war effort. Exactly. Uh, when the soldiers came home, many times they brought their parachutes as souvenirs since they were deemed unfit for service if they had encountered any kind of seawater or were damaged in any way. Right. So how perfect for a bride to honor her fighting fiancé by using the very thing that had helped bring him home safely. Nice. And after all the rationing that they had endured, now they had this, like, access, just this luxurious access to yards and yards of the perfect fabric for a gown. As many of the parachutes were white or cream colored, made from pure silk or a thin flowing nylon material. Right. A parachute provided more than enough. For a voluminous dress with big sleeves, grand train, and any other frilly details a girl might need for a wedding dress. Nice. Mm. So um, deep in the vaults of the Smithsonian Museum is a gorgeous dress made from the nylon parachute that saved the life of Major Claude Hensinger. Hensinger was a B-29 pilot that was forced to bail out of his plane when it caught fire during a bombing raid over Yawada, Japan. After landing safely on the ground with only minor injuries, Hensinger Hensinger used his parachute as a pillow and blanket while he waited to be rescued. So when he got to return home, he naturally brought the parachute with him. And when he proposed to his girlfriend in 1947, he did it 
giving her that parachute. Nice. Oh, wow. So Ruth wanted to create a gown similar to the one in the movie Gone with the Wind, and she hired a seam- seamstress to make a long sleeve off the shoulder bodice, but she made the skirt herself using the parachute material. It's beautifully draped in the front. It's kind of like she pulled the strings right. to make it drape so that it's only floor length, but in the l- back was left long to create this long flowing train. Here, I have a picture of it, you guys, just to see. It is gorgeous. Oh, my goodness. To think that it's made from a parachute. That's we'll have this up on our social media. Very. Oh, that is beautiful. That yeah. is amazing. And the dress was worn by Ruth, her daughter, and then her son's bride before being gifted to the Smithsonian. And unfortunately, I'm not sure why, but the dress is not on display. Uh, but what? it is owned by the, the, that is the Smithsonian. Am- that is amazing. And I got this from a uh, article, uh, article by Rose Heichelbeck, I think, and DustyOldThing.com and uh, Smithsonian or SI.edu. You know, when uh, Queen Elizabeth, well, at that time, Princess Elizabeth got married in, I think, 1952, or was it? Uh, 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 there was still, uh, uh, was, things were still in short supply. And so they, they had difficulty finding material for her dress, it seems like, and, uh, you know, um, but I remember, I remember reading about that, and you know, supplies were short, so that silk was, um, or nylon was really a a good thing to have uh, for making those dresses in right? those days. Mm. Well, and everybody was just in this whole um, attitude of industrial, you know, industriousness and and, and rationing and make work and make, with what yeah, you had. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Make, make do, make yeah. do with what you had, and it made some gorgeous gowns. You can really, you can Google. Uh, parachute wedding dresses and they're they're just they're so amazing looking right well now from repeller.com r-e-p-e-l-l-e-r.com we find some stories of some more couples with unusual how we met stories um a traumatic event actually brought this couple together uh, a woman named dolly uh age 34 Met her husband Matthew, age thirty-five, when he was um, when he was when she, I'm sorry when she was his occupational therapist. Matt was involved in a terrible car accident in 2014. He had suffered internal organ damage, various fractions fractures, uh, and a spinal cord injury. The accident left him paralyzed from the waist down, and he also lost a friend who was in the car with him at the time. Mm. Dolly says. Quote, I was working at a rehab hospital as an occupational therapist, and Matt was transferred to my unit to begin his rehabilitation process. He needed to learn how to move again without the use of his legs. I was the first person to transfer him out of a hospital bed and into a wheelchair. My first impression of Matt was that he was incredibly strong. I admired his work ethic and his attitude toward recovery. When we first met, our relationship was strictly professional, but when Matt was transferred to a different rehab program after spending two and a half weeks at my facility, I told him to keep in touch with me and let me know how his recovery progressed. We stayed in contact, texted each other regularly, and he eventually invited me to a birthday party his friends were holding for him at the hospital. When he asked, I was I was conflicted. I remember looking in the mirror and asking myself, Dolly, what are you doing? It was at that moment that I realized that I had feelings for him. I think that right from the start of our romantic relationship, we both knew that we had something very special. My mother had told me to carefully reflect on what life would be like with a man in a wheelchair, to know that things would be different, and to understand how life might be just a little harder than a typical life. None of that mattered to me. We We belonged together. Um, A reoccurring theme in our relationship has always been happy accidents. We always just go with the flow and embrace whatever life dishes out for us. It's been five years now, and we have a home and are of our own and a beautiful little girl. So even though things may be a bit harder for us, we wouldn't change a thing. Wow. Great story, oh, that, isn't it? Yeah, that is a great story. All right, now we have another one. Uh, this is Lauren and Paul. And Lauren writes, it was October 2010, and I had ended a long-term relationship just two weeks prior. So needless to say, I wasn't looking for anyone. No, that's when you find me. Yeah, Yeah, that's it. Yeah. I had two tickets to a Twilight convention and took my little sister along. That's where I met Paul. There aren't that many guys attending. Really? Really? (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> Other than those already with partners. That's so surprising to me. But anyway, my friend, uh, uh, my friend group decided to ask him to join our table at lunch. We had a masquerade themed party that evening, so we were all wearing masks and fancy ball gowns. We had our photo taken together, and I really didn't think much of it until a few days after the con- convention had ended and we got to chatting. We spent the next month spending hours on the phone discussing every topic imaginable and finding out that we were actually very similar. We made it official just before Christmas that year and got married in 2016. Now we have a daughter named Alice after one of the characters of Twilight. I, I just need to know, like, does this Paul sparkle in the sun? <laughs> <laughs> okay okay moving on uh, uh well maybe it does we'll we'll we'll, we'll say that yes it does okay. he's a night owl now <laughs> this is an interesting story going back a few years again gerda weissman uh she was a polish-born american writer uh who was forced by the nazis during world war ii to march for months along with four thousand other jewish women she lost 65 family members during the war mm. Mm. Only 120 of the 4,000 women survived the war. Near the end of the war, the Nazis abandoned the women in a factory where they lived without proper food for days. She was one day shy of her 21st birthday, wearing rags, and had not bathed in three years when Kurt Klein, a lieutenant in the United States Army, found her and rescued her. The couple was engaged in September 1945 and married shortly thereafter. Oh, that's... Wow. (laughs) Wow, that is... Yeah... Really, you, cool you story. hear amazing stories about the about the soldiers who found those survivors that way and the impact that it had on them. But that was a nice ending for them. For both of them, for sure. Couples make promises to live together and die together. Well, Helen and Les actually proved this. Call it a matter of sheer luck or crazy true love. Helen and Les were born on the same day, December 31st, 1918. The two ascended, attended the same school where they met each other and fell in love. These high school sweethearts eloped and lived 75 years together. Wow. During the last days of their lives, Les was sick with Parkinson's disease and slipped into a coma while Helen was battling stomach cancer. She died on July 16th and Les passed away a day after without even knowing about his wife's death. The couple were both 94 years old. Wow. You know, I've heard about that a lot, though, where one couple or one one will pass away and then the other just days later or or, you know, a week later or so. Uh, Before I read the next one, I will tell a a family story. My my first wife's parents, uh, she died about 15 years ago, but their her parents are still alive and I'm still close to them. They eloped on Christmas Day, (laughs) 1951. 1951, they eloped on Christmas Day. Uh, they, they, they found a judge who was willing to come to his office and marry them. Uh, and uh, the wife, uh, the judge's wife witnessed, but uh, she wouldn't even get out of a car, kind of in a huff, I guess, about having a Christmas Day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, spoiled by this couple that wanted to get married. And so then they looked for something to eat. Well, it was in Austin, Texas on uh, Christmas Day, 1951, not much was open back in those days, but they found a little beer joint, bar and grill, <laughs> and they had a hamburger, which immediately made her sick, so she spent the rest of the day throwing up. Oh, um, no. <laughs> so it was not a very great beginning for them, but uh, they have just marked their 70th anniversary nice. this past December. Uh, unfortunately, she's slipping a bit into uh, uh, dementia, so she's not quite uh, as aware of what's going on. Yeah. But they're two of my favorite people in the world. I'm wow. very, very Aww. close to to um, uh, to my in-laws, uh, Glenn so, and Janine Singleton. Why did they elope? I mean, was there? Um, I'm not exactly. Well, they had both grown up as, as family friends together. They're both. They're 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 both. Let's see. Their fathers had met in the first in the third grade and had been lifelong friends, and so their kids all kind of grew up together, and so they were afraid their families wouldn't. They were like brothers and sisters too much almost. They were afraid their families would um, oh, would not accept the. Oh, the, so it was a defiant thing. It was like a, a secret. Yeah, it was thing. kind of a, a, a okay. secret, and uh, they kept it quiet for uh, a few weeks. <laughs> 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 a few weeks, actually. Oh, that's awesome. Well, um, this this next story was told by uh, by the couple's daughter Tanya and their granddaughter Emily. Um, Svetlana and Lev 
L-E-V. They have no photos from their wedding in 1961. They got married with a stranger as their witness in the country of Georgia, part of the old Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Both children of the war who survived the Holocaust as infants, Svetlana and Lev met as 14-year-old school children in Ukraine. He was the popular guy from the wealthy family, and she was the sweet, studious girl who came from nothing. Lev bullied Svetlana by pulling her pigtails and making her do his homework. <laughs> Little did she realize that that was his way of expressing his crush on her. Boys are kind of funny that way. From That's sometimes. right. A little weird. That's right. If, if <laughs> uh, you know, if you're in elementary school and a boy is like punching you, yeah. Although just, now just I'm a, that, at, yeah. at junior high, I see girls doing it now too. I'm a junior <laughs> high teacher. Anyway, uh, Svetlana lived in such extreme poverty that Lev organized a drive through a school to get her a warm winter coat. Their love developed into their teen, year, uh, teen years, but then he was drafted, and uh, at the age of 18, he, and he was sent to the region of Georgia. But that didn't stop them uh, once he got to Georgia. Uh, after exchanging many letters, she finally made the journey to not only visit, but to marry him. Now, during those times, it was very brave for a young girl to travel by herself in Soviet Russia. Lev was allowed only a few hours away from his base to see his bride, he brought along a fellow soldier as a witness uh, at the local city hall. The papers were signed, and they celebrated with King Call, or I'm sorry, King Collie, which is Georgian dumplings. <laughs> um, the uh, incredible match went on to grow a beautiful family of three daughters, and Svetlana and Lev immigrated to America through a Jewish refugee program in 1996. To this day, they still sing to each other. And make each other laugh. Aww. So happy Valentine's Aww. Day, happy Svetlana Valentine's Day. and Lev. Okay, That's so my awesome. my grandparents fell in love, or they met when uh, my grandfather was. Uh, I don't. I don't think he was stationed at Fort Knox in Kentucky, but he he went through there, and there were dances and and everything. Mm -hmm. And my grandmother went to a dance, and they danced together. And uh, but then he went off. You know, they got married, right. and he went off to war. And that we still have their their love letters. They went through the war. So. Oh, right. wow. We have yeah. my, my wife's parents as well. They wrote each other a lot. And now for something completely off topic and off kilter. Brace yourself for the oddity du jour. Okay, so for today's oddity, David Slater is a nature photographer. A few years ago, he traveled to Indonesia to take photographs of the critically endangered Celebus crested macaques. Slater and his assistant spent several days following the monkeys around to gain their trust, and when he tried to photograph them, though, the monkeys were very interested in the camera equipment and tried several times to run away with it. I think they did actually uh -huh. steal the camera equipment a couple times. Um, but they were they really were just too shy for Slater to get quality close up photos that he wanted. So finally Slater set down the camera or set the camera up with a certain auto settings and while holding on to the tripod so they didn't <laughs> run away with it. Off. He gave mon the monkeys free reign to inspect the camera and to press the button to snap <laughs> their own photos, Fun. okay? The macaques <clears throat> loved it. They spent about 30 minutes looking at the reflections in the camera lens and playing with the camera gear, triggering the remote multiple times and capturing many photographs. <laughs> Slater said that the session went on until, the do quote, the dominant male came over excited and eventually gave me a whack with his hand as he bounced off my back, <laughs> <laughs> signifying it's over. But the session was a success with many really good photos of the monkeys. One photo in particular would make Slater famous. Naruto. Okay, so this was on a like a reserve. Right. The monkeys. Yeah, this wasn't right. just out in the wild. Um, Naruto, a six-year-old celibus crested macaque, smiled and mugged for the camera, and the photo made Naruto an instant celebrity, internet <laughs> celebrity. Get a load of this picture. We're gonna, I mean, it looks like it's photoshopped. I mean, he's exactly. just looking at like, it, <laughs> smiling, grinning into the camera. <laughs> That's too good. So I think I have a nephew that may try to <laughs> make, have, smile similarly. In in early July of 2011, several publications, including the Telegraph and the Guardian, published the pictures, along with articles that quoted Slater as describing the photographs as, as self portraits taken by the monkeys, and that's that's important. It comes up right. Slater also published the photographs in his uh, self-published book, Wildlife Personalities. So a few days that later... certainly has personality. Right, that he way. does. <laughs> that, uh, yes, this picture definitely has a lot of personality. <laughs> so a few days later, on July 9th, an editor at Wikimedia Commons grabbed the photo of Naruto from an online article and uploaded it to their site, which effectively placed the picture in the public domain. 
Slater protested, claiming ownership of the image and asked them to remove the photo. The foundation refused, stating that the copy- copyright cannot vest in a non-human author and when and, quote, when a work's copyright cannot vest in a human, it falls into the public domain. Well, he was holding the tripod. Yeah, right. you know, well, and he's... He I, set up the camera. Okay, that, uh, I, I'm, I'm firmly on his side. Like, yeah. he set all of this up. He made it happen. He just didn't press the button. Right. Anyway, so Slater continued to insist that he was the rightful owner of the photographs, not the monkeys, <laughs> since he did everything to ensure the photos came out well, everything but press the button. Slater took the matter to court. Because, I mean, this is his livelihood, oh, yeah. too. You're, you know? you're right. You're messing with yeah. So the widely shared, I mean, once it's out there, it's out there. That's and it's for sure. It's yeah, and, it, and it's a cute photo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The widely shared image became the center of a lengthy lawsuit mm. over whether Slater owned the rights to it or belonged to the monkey and thus fallen to, to public domain. The outcome of the initial trial was that the animals were not included in copyright law, so copyright was owned by Slater. However, just when the media hubbub around the disagreement died down, PETA sued Slater and the self-publishing company he used to publish the book of his photography for infringing on Naruto's copyright, insisting that the image belonged to the monkey. Oh, my goodness. So PETA, for those that, that don't know, uh, stands for the, the uh, for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Slater and PETA came to the agreement that 25% of future revenue of the images taken by the monkeys would go to terrible organizations that protect Naruto and other crested macaques. And okay, so they, they okay. came to this, this agreement um, because it became apparent that neither one of them really wanted to go forward with the court case. Um, so that was that, right? right. Except <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> Yeah. Can PETA really sue on the behalf of a monkey? According to TheVerge.com, it's unclear. Under Ninth Circuit precedents, or precedent, a case called Cetacean versus Bush, where a self-appointed attorney for all of the world's whales, porpoises, and dolphins sued over the Navy's use of sonar. <laughs> animals okay. do not have standing to sue. Okay, Anything. so the precedent was animals do not have standing to sue unless Congress clearly writes it into the statute. Right. So by upholding their case against Slater and insisting on the agreement, PETA would actually be bringing attention to that precedent and likely affirm it, which was something right. they really didn't want to do. So they were right. willing to, to compromise and make this ag- agreement with him. They just um, wanted the they wanted the contribution to go back to one they, of the yeah, yeah. They wanted the, the monkeys. to the monkeys. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but they yeah. chose to, to, to go dismiss, this direction, the, so. dismiss right. the case and go with this agreement. And it was great news because Slater and his attorneys also wanted to d- dismiss the right. case. Right, right. But no. Um, the Ninth Circuit stated that the court doesn't have to dismiss a case just because the parties agree to dismiss oh. it. Oh, Lord. Was Ooh. PETA allowed to – I mean, you know. Yeah, oh, they wanted to yeah. settle it. Was yeah. PETA allowed to bring the case? Are monkeys even allowed to sue? We won't know the answers to these questions. It's still going on until the Ninth Circus, Circuit hands down its decision. I got my information from TheVerge.com, NewYorkTimes.com, and Wikipedia. And it's funny because, you know, wow. you've got all these monkeys and they got pictures and they're wild and yeah. crazy, but they're like going on with their lives while right. we're right. over here <laughs> fighting this <laughs> <mess> out. <laughs> Debating whether they really care or not. But that picture and who, and who owns is the rights? Awesome. Right. Who owns oh. the rights? Well, I mean, the picture is out there. So yeah, once you put it out done. in the right. public domain, right. that's it. Yeah. It's but, long gone. But they, you know... There are other pictures, and I'm sure this is What's the new thing in college, with college athletes? Uh, um, image and naming rights or something like that that they can now, yes. they can now sell. Um, uh, college athletes can, uh, in like if they're used in video games or something. Well, like and that's that. the thing. The thing about media uh, in general, just it's always constantly mm-hmm. changing, and yeah. the laws are changing and everything. So anyway. Well, now let's get back to our, uh, our, our some of our stories, and let's talk about some celebrities. Shall love! We? Yeah, celebrity <laughs> love stories. All um, Michael Douglas and Catherine Zeta-Jones, everybody's familiar with them, I believe. Mm-hmm. They were introduced in 1998 by Danny DeVito, of all people. <laughs> Imagine Danny DeVito is your matchmaker. I love Danny DeVito. <laughs> I do, too. Um well, anyway, Douglas said that he knew that the night that he met Zeta Jones that he wanted to marry her. I found out that we share the same birthday the first night, although his, I think, was in a much earlier year. <laughs> but never, anyway. What's a decades? Yeah. What's a, what are a few decades, anyway? Um, 
Let's see. Oh, anyway, I, uh, the, the night I met her, and after she told me that, and after she told me that she loves golf, I told her, I'm going to be the father of your children. That's a good start, huh? <laughs> and then pickable. she said, good night. <laughs> yep. See ya. Well, I thought it was a proper thing to say, but maybe I was a little presumptuous, but it seems to have worked out for them. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, now celebrity romances, they don't always last long, but and I don't think this one is still together, but it did have an interesting start, so we'll throw it in here. Uh, Jennifer Lopez and Alex Rodriguez uh, uh, met when he was lost in a parking lot. A-Rod told Ellen DeGeneres that he didn't recognize Jennifer Lopez at first, though they were aware of each other, and often attended the same events. I'm walking outside, and I forget where I parked my car. I have no idea. Someone taps me on the shoulder, and I turn around, and I do not recognize this person. And it's Jennifer, but she's dressed up as Harley from Shades of Blue, and she's in her jeans and her big boots, and it took me about four or five seconds, and she says, Jennifer, it's Jennifer. And I said, oh, my God, Jennifer, you look beautiful. I was so embarrassed, and then I got a little nervous. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Now, uh, famous tennis star Serena Williams met her husband in a very romantic city, talking about something not at all romantic, rats. <laughs> uh, this gentleman named Alex Ohamian, O-H-A-N-I-A-N, was at a conference in Rome uh, while Williams was playing at a tournament there. They happened to be at the same cafe when Williams' assistant tried to tell Ohanian to move tables because there was a rat near his table. He replied, thank you, but I'm from Brooklyn. I see rats all the time. It's really not a big deal. <laughs> Williams turned around and asked if he was really wasn't freaked out by the rats, and then they struck up a conversation and began dating shortly after. Oh, wow. <laughs> by the way, Ohanian is one of the co-founders of Reddit. Oh, really? Oh, oh, social Reddit. media site, Reddit. Yeah. So, yeah, Mr. Ahamian, if you're looking for a podcast to sponsor, <laughs> we're we'd your like podcast. To talk to you. <laughs> we'd like to talk to you. Now, Kate Winslet, you remember her from Titanic? Uh huh. Well, she met her husband when he helped guide her and her children to safety during a house fire on Necker Island in the Caribbean. Oh, wow. Winslet and her family were staying with Sir Richard Branson at his luxury villa when it was struck by lightning. Now, this fellow's name, uh, his actual name is Edward Abel Smith. But uh, at some point in the past, he's changed his name to Ned Rock and Roll. <laughs> okay. And so, if you can. <laughs> Ned Rock and Roll. Uh, evidently, he had one of those uh, flashlights that you wear on your head, you know, with a strap. And uh, so he helped guide them to safety using a headlamp. Uh, I met my husband in a house fire, the star told E.T., I found a bra and passports and my children, so I married him. <laughs> I was like, I'll go for the guy who has the head torch. Okay, so I see now. Kate, rock and roll. <laughs> well, actually, I was reading a little bit later today. You know, uh, she's she's trying to talk him into going back and using his, his regular name. She says, every time we go to the doctor's office and I have to fill out paperwork, I have to write Ned Rock and Roll, and are we going to really keep doing this? <laughs> <laughs> is, is this that over yet? <laughs> oh wow! And you know, she, you know, if if they were out in the middle of the freezing ocean, would she let him on the door? Uh, you know? <laughs> uh, knock knock. Let, let, leave him there. Yeah. Anyway, uh, can from, I borrow your headlamp? <laughs> from brides.com, Carrie Mulligan and Marcus Mumford's love story is one for the books. The couple first became acquainted as childhood pen pals and later reconnected and fell for each other as adults. The celebrated actress and Mumford & Sons frontman first got to know each other as children growing up in the UK. As the story goes, they met at a Christian holiday camp when Mulligan was 12 years old. Carrie and Marcus began sending each other letters through their churches when they were kids. Oh, wow. Years later, the pen pals would reunite in Nashville, Tennessee, at a secret Mumford & Sons show that Carrie attended. Evidently, Marcus invited Carrie to watch him play a secret show in the basement of his friend's home in Nashville. She sat in the front row, and while he was singing, Marcus looked down at Carrie, and she blushed. It was oh. clear that they had chemistry. At the end of the night, they were just the musicians, Jake, Carrie, and the Mumford boys, a source told Us Weekly. We had some pizza, and we just played music. Jake picked up a guitar, and <laughs> Carrie joined in on Amazing Grace. Marcus and Carrie seemed really friendly. A, mu a few months later, after getting reacquainted, the pair was ready to spend an eternity together. According to the tabloids, Marcus popped the question in July 2011 while vacationing with her in Somerset, England. 
Hey, we mentioned that before. That's where the uh, older couple lived that were separated for eight decades, right? Right. Yeah. Came back in Somerset. That's a good place. And that's the same location where they later tied the knot. In April 2012, more than 100 of the couple's closest friends and family members gathered together in a quaint barn in Somerset, England, to watch the couple exchange their vows. Marcus's father, John Mumford, who is a vicar, officiated the intimate ceremony. Nice, nice story. That's awesome. Now, from uh, townandcountrymagazine.com, or townandcountrymag.com. That's how they say it in the business, you know. <laughs> townandcountrymag.com. We're going to be there, are we? Yeah. Shorten everything. Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward met during production of Picnic. It was a movie, I believe, that they were both in. And shortly married after filming a, dif a different movie called The Long Hot Summer. Now, unlike most on-set Hollywood romances... Newman and Woodward were happily devoted to one another for 50 years. Yep. When asked about his marriage to Woodward and infidelity, Newman famously responded, I have a steak at home. Why should I go out for hamburger? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> the couple traded the California spotlight for Westport, Connecticut, Connecticut, where they raised their family and remained until Paul Newman's death in 2008. Mm -hmm. so it's good to see a Hollywood romance that actually lasted. Now we're going way back in history for this one. John and Abigail Adams. Abigail Smith married the founding father at age 20, gave birth to five children, including America's sixth president, John Quincy Adams, and was John Adams' confidant, political advisor, and first lady. The more than 1,000 letters they wrote to each other offer a window into John and Abigail's mutual devotion and abiding friendship. Wow. It was more than revolutionary political ideas that kept them so united. They shared a trust and abiding tenderness. Abigail wrote, quote, There is a tie more binding than humanity and stronger than friendship. And by this cord, I am not ashamed to say that I am bound, nor do I believe that you are wholly free of it. Boy, that doesn't get the mm. juices rolling. What does? I don't know. <laughs> As for John, he wrote, I want to hear you think. See your thoughts. The conclusion of your letter makes my heart throb more than a cannonade would. <laughs> a heck of a letter. <laughs> now, there's some lines for you. Yeah. Wow. Now, and she was always instrumental in uh, in the early part of the government, as you know, um, when um, he lost his re-election bid. The White House was not complete, but she wanted them to move into it anyway. And so they actually moved into the incomplete White, White House, House. Yeah. to be the first couple there. Now, I love this couple. Grace Kelly and Prince Rainier of Monaco. In the wedding of the century, American film star Grace Kelly left Hollywood behind at the height of her career to wed Prince Rainier and become Princess of Monaco. She was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen any of her movies, she was really stunningly beautiful. Prince Rainier was immediately taken with Grace, whom he met when she filmed To Catch a Thief in the French Riviera. He courted her through letters for some time, and before the couple announced their engagement in the Kelly family's Philadelphia home and married in 1956, uh, Prince Rainier never remarried after Grace's tragic death in 1982. You remember she, she her car went off the cliff. Yeah. Interestingly enough, in the movie To Catch a Thief, there is a scene in which her car also goes, goes off, off a, cliff. a cliff in the same area. Okay, so so these have been some really heartwarming and lovely love stories. Oh, I mean, you're going to take us oh. in a different direction now? <laughs> They're so precious. Wow. Now for something truly strange and bizarre. <laughs> hey, we go the opposite direction. <laughs> I have a story about when love turns into an unhealthy obsession. Ooh, okay. oh. Born in 1909, Maria Elena Milagro de Hoyas was a beautiful Cuban-American woman. But she had a bit of a tragic life. So shortly after marrying, she suffered a miscarriage and then her husband abandoned her. Oh. Um, then Elena, as she was called, contracted tuberculosis, which at the time was usually right. a terminal yeah, diagnosis. Fatal. She sought treatment at the U.S. Marine Hospital in Key West. That's where she met radio radiologic technologist Carl Tanz Tanzler. Not much is known definitively about Carl Tanzler other than he was born in Germany, emigrated to the United States, and had many different names that he went by. He settled in Florida and, with his self-professed medical knowledge, took a job at the <laughs> hospital where he would cross paths with Elena. Despite being over 30 years older, Tanzler immediately fell in love with Elena and eagerly assured her and her parents that he would do everything in his power to treat her tuberculosis. 
He used many varieties of medications as well as x-ray and electrical equipment, much of which he brought into Elena's home. He showered her with gifts of jewelry and clothing. Tansler eventually professed his love for Elena, but there's no indication to show that she ever reciproca- reciprocated his affections. Mm. I really think uh, that she and her family allowed his attention because he was giving her medical treatments right. that they, they probably wouldn't have been able to afford. Sure. So in spite of everything, Elena succumbed to the tuberculosis on October 25th, 1931, at the young age of 22. So, I mean, mm. in her mm. short life, she right. went through so much. She had also <laughs> lost a sister. Hmm. Earlier, I think, also to tuberculosis, oh, wow. and her brother-in-law was was electrocuted. I mean, it's just so much had happened in her short life. So with her parents' permission, Tanzler paid for the funeral and the construction of an above-ground mausoleum in the Key West Cemetery. Well, you know, this is sad, but this doesn't seem like it's dark to me. Well, Tanzler. Oh, you mean there's more? <laughs> yeah, this is, we're not even Uh-oh. halfway through this. Oh, my goodness. Tanzler visited Elena's mausoleum every night, and he said that Elena's spirit would come out and visit him, and he would sing to her. Oh. It's believed that he, quote, heard Elena calling to him from her grave, asking him to free her from her stone prison. And that's when things got weird. Hey. Yeah. One night in April of 1933, nearly two years after her death, okay, Tanzler removed Elena's body from the crypt and used a toy wagon to take her to his home. Oh. <laughs> her body was falling apart, so oh. Tanzler stuffed her body with rags and used coat uh, or wire and coat hangers to hold the bones together. He placed silk that had been soaked in wax and plaster over her uh over her decomposing skin, and then dressed the body in her own clothing, um, in her own clothing, jewelry, and gloves. Like he, he oh. made her up. He used copious amounts of perfume, disinfectants, and preserving agents to mask the odor and to slow decom- decomposition, uh, further decomp. He then he placed her in his bed, where he kept her for seven years. Did, wait, did he sleep in the same bed? Yes. Oh, oh my God. Yes. So Elena's sister, Florinda, heard rumors of what was happening. But, like, who would he have told that to? Right. You know, I don't know how, how, many, the, it, how it got out. I mean, I buying a lot of perfume. I, I don't know. But anyway, Florinda went to Tansler's house to confront him and came face to face with what was left of her poor sister. Oh. Tansler was arrested and detained. The only thing that they could charge him with, though, was desecration of a tomb. Laws against stealing a corpse were not on the books at that time. They probably got yeah, on the books quickly they after. That Where would have that come in? Psy- <laughs> Psychiatrists, now. you know, they studied him and they found him mentally competent to stand trial, but the trial was dismissed because the statute of limitations had expired. Tansler went free. Ugh. So no evidence was given that Tansler had sexual relations with Elena's corpse, but then why wouldn't he? He had already pushed that on. <laughs> you know? thinking, He's living I'm on the south side of right right there. there. Yeah, yeah, so... Um, and I'm not sure why, but after, and this is so sad, afterwards, after officials had done their examination of Elena's body, it was then put on display at a funeral home in Key West where spectators were free to come by and satisfy their morbid curiosity. This poor family, uh-huh. right? Why wouldn't they just allow her to go back into the yeah, uh, I don't, her I don't tomb? Know. I, I don't mean, know. really? There was no explanation for that. That's crazy. Uh, but afterwards, um, she was reburied in an unmarked grave in a secret location. Well, maybe it, the case gained a lot of notoriety Maybe, there, perhaps, oh, maybe, so. but I'm thinking her, family, so macabre. <laughs> her yeah. poor family. The case, uh, understandably, drew a lot of attention and, and created quite a sensation in both local papers as well as across the nation. And believe it or not, the public was generally sympathetic towards Tanzler. They mm. they viewed him as a romantic, tragic character. And I'm thinking... He's a creep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, and you would think that he'd be ashamed of all this, but he seemed to revel in the notoriety. And he wrote an autobiography that was published in a magazine in 1947. He never got mm. over his obsession. Oh, my mm. gosh. He created another likeness of her this time, unfortunately, without body parts, well, um, and kept it in his bed until his death in 1952. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, that's a strange so, story. Right um, and I got my information from American Haunting Inc. That's Inc. with a K dot com and Wikipedia. Oh, my goodness. That's just that's Okay. Just so one last love story. This one's bizarre, but not so dark. Okay. 
just to bring it up, (laughs) as one of the most tangible symbols of communism, the Berlin Wall provoked strong feelings in many people as the cold and graffiti concrete stood separating east from west. But as you know, it was torn down to the sounds of great rejoicing from both sides in 1989, signifying the end of the Cold War. One woman in particular, though, was not happy about the destruction. She had very strong feelings about the wall, or rather, she had very strong feelings for the wall. Um, <laughs> it's an Ayurita, Ayurita Berliner Mauer wept for days when the wall came down. She grew up in the 70s and somehow developed a very bu- bizarre fetish in which she is attracted to inanimate objects. Mm. Notably concrete walls. <laughs> it's a rare condition for which she actually had a medical diagnosis. It's called object sexuality, and people with this condition find themselves with extreme feelings of love, commitment, or attraction to any sort of inanimate object and may even find normal human attraction repulsive. Mm. So Aya Rita Berliner Mauer, her last name was Berliner Mauer, has uh, revealed that she has been married to the Berlin Wall for 10 years oh. before its demise. <laughs> yeah. Her family name, Berliner Mauer, does actually translate to Berlin Wall in German. <laughs> and she claimed to have fallen in love with a wall when she was seven years old and saw it on TV. All while collecting every photo she could, Aya Rita, 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 uh-huh. I'm sorry, Aya Rita, saved money to visit her beloved barrier, and finally on her sixth visit in 1979, she then decided to make everything official and married the Berlin married Wall. Married the Berlin Wall. Ooh. When the wall was dis- demolished, Aya Rita, wa- Rita was distraught. She left the area and has never returned and claimed that they mutilated her poor husband. She insists, though, that they had had a loving and full relationship. I will leave you with one last cl- quote by Mrs. Berliner Mauer. The Great Wall of China is attractive, but he's too thick. My husband is sexier. Oh, jeez. <laughs> That's strange. I got my in, uh, my <laughs> information from InsideTonight.com. Uh, there was a, a cool article on it by Grace Higgins. And now it's time, boys and girls, for the trivia challenge. <laughs> Okay, I don't have the last page. Oh, you don't? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got both of them. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Just got this all I did. Uh, stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because the, the, <laughs> <'cause laughs> the, the idea of wallflower are a whole different meaning. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. Well, now it's time for that trivia challenge. You know how this works, folks. Like and follow our Facebook page at Remnants Do Podcast. Like and share this episode post. Put your answer to the trivia challenge question in the comments of that post. The first person to do all of that will be the winner and will be mentioned in an upcoming episode of Remnant Stew. And get some cool socks. Get some cool socks as well. Okay, so thanks to to Harbin Gold for this one. Um, Soraya and Roscoe from Myrtle Beach are an odd couple, but they truly love each other and are best friends. What makes this such an odd couple? Oh, that sounds like a good good question right there. Okay. Phil here reminding you to check out our Facebook and Instagram pages at Remnant Stew Podcast. Drop us an email at staycurious at remnantstew.com just to say hi or to let us know about any topics you would like us to cover in an upcoming episode. Don't forget to go to our website and hit show the love and leave us a comment positive, please. Remnant Stew is created by me, Leah Lamp. Dr. Stephen Meeker and I research, write, and host each episode, along with cringy commentary <laughs> by, <are> our, <laughs> by our audio producer, Philip Sinkfeld. Theme music is by Kevin McLeod with voiceover by Morgan Hughes. Special thanks to Judy Meeker and to Harbin Gould. Well, before you go, please hit the follow button so you won't miss an episode. Head over to Apple Music and leave us a review. Thank you, Rebecca and Marvel Lover 2.0. Uh, Share Remnant Stew with your friends, family, fiancé, wedding planner, and that crazy ex, you know the one. Until next time, remember to choose to be kind and and always stay stay curious. curious.